Brought to you by BedroomBattlefields.com, this is the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. Welcome to the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast, it's Matthew with you here. We're going to dive straight into a bit of preamble and a report of a game that I played recently with Robert. It was a game of Planet 28, and we played a kind of adapted scenario from the uh, the sci-fi skirmish scenarios book, which I talk about quite a lot on this show. So uh, let's get straight into it then. You'll hear about the setup, you'll hear about some of the wee tweaks we made to various rules and the scenario itself, and then you'll hear the, uh, the post-mortem as well and hear how it all went. Let's go. So what we've got here is a, a pretty standard derelict sci-fi world. Yeah. And you'll see that there's a lot of built-up terrain around the edge of the table. But then in the middle, we've got like crates and barrels and stuff like that. And it's quite an exposed area. So the objective for these two warbands, what you've got, you've got, again, I like to do this, bad guys and good guys. The good guys are probably not very good. The bad guys are probably quite bad. So uh, so the bad guys are like a kind of undead style warband. There's um, a couple of like skeleton space marine type guys, guy with a staff who's potentially a necromancer and a, a magic user as well who's floating about there. He's either coming back from the bar with two like snowballs or it's it's kind of like magic in his hands, maybe we fireballs, punitive fireballs. Draw your own conclusions. Oh yeah, he can maybe doing the thriller dance. He's got his hands in a kind of like he's got the reins of a horse a little bit, and he's about yeah. to start doing that skippy knee thing. And he's making the noise, the na- the neighing noise. Yeah, my daughter actually does that, <laughs> yeah, but then she's two and not a miniature. Um, on the 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 so called good guys side, just some like mercenary grunt type guys led by see the guy with the the big coat on. He's uh, no, he's nearer. Aye, him. Oh, yeah. Decker from Blade Runner. I called him Agent Jake Et because he's got his <laughs> Jake on. So the the aim of this is to get one of your miniatures to the the objective, the, the, those crates. Yeah. There's some sort of artifact in there, okay? And, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you know in a second what that might be about. But the objective is to get one of your guys next to that pile of crates and have them there as the game ends. There's a couple of wee caveats to this too, but there's also a couple of NPCs, not player characters, non-player characters it is, isn't it? I say a couple, there's four of them. So up here, yeah. there's two little like undead classic 1950s aliens, and you've got two of them down in that corner as well. These are just something I've added in to mix things up a bit, because... With us being in cover and shooting at each other, it would be easy just to find a good spot and remain there. But with these wee guys kicking about, it, it maybe means that, you know, sitting in the same place for too long is going to attract some unwanted attention. Uh, so these wee guys will be coming after us as well. What I was thinking for them, again, just flying by the seat of my pants here, is that they only have one wound. So... If you kill them, they're removed, but they could maybe just then re-enter the table, like it would be a different one in terms of the, the story. Uh, they would just reappear on the the table, maybe the nearest edge of the table to where they were killed, if that makes sense. So they'll just keep coming then? Yeah, so they respawn. So yeah, although you, you might want to kill one to get them off your back, you know that you can't, there's no point in spending time killing these guys because they're just going to keep coming. Yeah, so I did wonder when you were saying that before that would I just go and hide well out of sight of you, wait for the guy to come close, you know, the NPC, the the Jeopardy one, and take him out and it's like, right, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, they keep coming. So, yeah. yeah, one wound, they're pretty low level. They'll maybe do a bit of damage eventually to you if they get up to you. They can't shoot, so they're just going to be getting a bit scratchy or bitey yeah. doing what undead things do. Um. So yeah, with this being like a kind of derelict sci-fi world, you've you've got essentially an undead warband or partly undead warband. So, I mean, you might imagine this is in those crates. There's some sort of artifact that 
if the bad guys got hold of it, they could control all the undead in this world. Whereas if the good guys got it, they could destroy all the undead in this world. So, Aye. you know, just a, a pretty standard sci-fi shootout with a wee bit of story underneath. Okie dokie. Oh, so this game, you might remember this, that the turn sequence, it wasn't you go, I go. It was a case of the each miniature, each character had an agility and that determined how soon they moved. Yeah. But I didn't really want these warbands to have massive differences in their quality. So they are pretty similar with a couple of exceptions. So what I've done instead, there's a deck of cards there. Yeah. I've taken a lead from Frostgrave or Rangers of Shadow Deep. So each of our characters has a their own card assigned to them. So we'll essentially just work our way through that deck and it'll be entirely random. So right, okay. you'll draw a card, you'll see, you know, it would be one of your guys or one of my guys, and then we'll just move them and we'll, we'll work our way through the deck. When we get to, again, this is something I've come up with, when we get to the Joker card, all of the aliens will move and that'll be them for that turn. Right, okay. All of the aliens will act. And like our players, they'll get two activations each as well. Uh, we always get two activations. Abilities wise, we we kind of we didn't use much of these the last time, or did we? So in terms of the abilities, I could I could remember we used a few of the abilities when we were playing Brutal Quest, but the one throw, or two. the throw one we forgot about, didn't we? Yeah, just picking somebody up and throwing them away. So I've I've actually uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast before, but I. I copied the rulebook into ChatGPT and asked it to come out with loads more potential traits and abilities. Obviously, you get a lot of junk when you do that, but you get yeah. a few of them that are decent and you can kind of tweak them a wee bit. There's one at the top, Distract. Distract. Once per game, this character can use an action to create a distraction. All enemy characters within line of sight... If partial cover roll d6, 1 to 3 are affected, 4 to 6 not affected. But all enemy characters otherwise within line of sight must pass an awareness skill roll or become distracted and miss the next turn. Tactician. Once per game, this character can provide tactical advice to a friendly character within line of sight. The chosen character gains a plus 2 bonus to their next action. That's quite cool. Chain Lightning. This powerful spell allows the caster to release a bolt of lightning that arcs between multiple targets. Make a P roll. Is that perception? Yeah. A uh, psych, sorry. Oh, oh, yeah, of course. Psych. If successful with the psych roll, choose a starting target within 30 centimetres range and line of sight. The lightning then jumps to the nearest enemy within 10 centimetres, dealing. 2d6 plus 2. That's quite good. That's your man that looks like he's on an invisible horse. Yeah, that's, that's going to be an average of like 8 damage. Repeat this process until there are no eligible targets or you fail the psych roll. Very nice. Aimed shot. This character may use an action to aim their weapon at an enemy's weak spot. Their weapon does an additional 1 D8 damage in their next attack this turn. I'm not sure if that was one of the default ones from the book or if that's one that yeah, was remember. created, but... Uh, and yeah, we've got Vengeful there. Vengeful. When this character takes damage from an enemy, they gain plus one F and plus one S. What's that, fight and shoot or something? Yeah, exactly. So fight being melee. Yeah. For the remainder of the game. Yeah, let me read that again. Vengeful. When they take damage from an enemy, they gain plus one fight, plus one shoot. For the remainder of the game versus that enemy, up to a maximum of plus three each. Applies to one enemy only. Yeah, so you could get a character that's pretty strong in the end against a specific character who's wronged them. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool, so that is some uh, little abilities that hopefully we remember to use and get some use out of. Uh, one other thing that we were forgetting to do in the last game that's relevant or useful is pushing back on, like it hand-to-hand will maybe be less common in this game, given that everyone's got guns. Yeah. But uh, 
if you get into melee combat, you can get a bit bogged down, can't you? You end up with folk kind of glued together. So yeah. if you win the combat, even if you don't inflict damage, you can push the character back a couple of centimetres. So as long as you remember that, it means that, you know, folk aren't basically getting glued in. Yeah, that's good. So it's pretty handy. Uh, I think that's it, though. I think that was all there was to to go over. We'll have a wee bash at it, see how it goes. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's one more thing, actually, one more thing. I talked about the fact that if you... I mean, the, the objective is to end the game with one of your characters unopposed by the enemy, and you're beside those, those crates. You're touching the crate or the barrel. You've got base contact with it, basically. Yeah. So if the... If this was just a standard six-turn game, you could obviously be a bit tactical about it and just hold folk in reserve and then just make a run for it on the last turn and hope for the best. But there's a pretty cool way around this. I'm going to show you the page of the book just now. That's the sci-fi skirmish scenarios book that we're using. This scenario is called Strut Your Stuff. So on the game length section, if you read that. Okay, game length. Introduce randomization for the exact length of the game to preclude chess like predictability of the end game. At the end of GL 1. So that's basically game length is like what it would be. So let's say six turns. So he's referring to the fifth turn here. Yeah. So let's say at the end of the fifth turn, roll a die. On a one or two, the game ends immediately. On a three or four, it ends on the next turn. And on a five or six, it ends after one additional turn. Interesting. So when we get to turn five... It might just be it over. End. Or, yeah, it might not. So it gives you that kind of, no, no, no. The bus might leave early, eh? We better yeah. get there. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, nothing else to do but get to it and roll some dice, I suppose. Smash some skulls. Stomp all over you. Yeah. yeah. So we, we got to the end of turn five there, Robert. It was already looking pretty bleak for me. Only two guys left on the table. Uh, you've got one of your guys at the objective and then we had to do the old roll. So what did we roll to see if the game continued or not? It was one or two to end early at the end of turn five. Three or four for like, well, normal would be like the end of one turn six. One more turn, yeah. Um, five or a six would have extended it by a turn. And we rolled a two, which meant it ended here and now with Mr. Pineapple, a.k.a. Grudge, standing next to the barrels and crates. Yeah, I mean, it didn't it didn't go very well for me, um, partly down to my own stupidity, but uh, I think you got into better positions earlier. I was kind of... I wasn't very sure what I was doing. I was skirting around the edges. Yeah. Um, I made a real blunder, so Scully, he's my probably my most powerful character and I went charging into that alien uh, needlessly and, and he like even though they're not particularly strong characters, the alien NPCs, the zombies he, he gave me a fair old headbutt and nearly killed me, I had to take a break test and if I'd failed that I was on, right on the edge of the table, that would have been him away yeah but um, that was interesting, I didn't realise that the aliens actually had 2d6 melee Mm. damage you know like so it was like oh if they do hit it's gonna hurt yeah lot, like they're know? they're easy to kill they're easy to get away from they're easy to kill but y you don't want to get bitten by one so um i mean they they livened up they prevented us from just staying in the same positions yeah it becomes then just a dice rolling exercise like there's no point in even having miniatures on the table so it was good that they helped keep things moving yeah, because initially I'd split my guys, two went one way, three another, and the forces, you know, was it two of them I had or three? Three of them were over the far side of the table from where I am, and I realised I was going to have two aliens right behind me as well as your guys skirting towards me, so kind of a two of them abandoned, uh, what's his name, Slinger, the Mohawk guy, and ran over, so I concentrated on the side nearest me and just left Slinger up there to kind of just run interference, basically. And I concentrated more on my side of the table, which worked out for me anyway. 
Um, one thing we did adjust on the fly early on was the range, wasn't it? So yeah, you had two sets of so the lighter the lighter guns they had a range of twelve centimeters, and the heavier guns had a range of thirty. And what we found was that it just wasn't very far, was it? And you could actually have been in the position where you could have had somebody on the objective in the middle of the table, and even though a lot of folk would have line of sight on them. They didn't have the range, so we just extended that, didn't we? We said 60 yeah. centimetres and 24 centimetres. Yeah, because otherwise, if you can move 20 centimetres in one turn, but you can only shoot 12, you could effectively outrun somebody's blast, if mm-hmm. you like. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, doesn't really translate into real terms, but it was like, yeah, they, it just needs to be a little bit further. And then having that range, I mean, half of the characters on the table had, you know, as long as they had line of sight, range was no obstacle to them and it made it pretty deadly for popping your head out a yeah. classic example of this so I had this character um, what was his name again let's the magician guy Malgorath the Voidbinder the guy who looked like he was on his imaginary horse so a really frail character but he, he had that really powerful chain lightning spell and I think the only remotely tactically impressive thing I did all game was keep him you know I, I negotiated him up to a position you brought a few guys forward quite exposed and then I finally jumped out from behind this wall and tried to get this chain lightning spell away and if it had all gone to plan which it obviously didn't uh, that could have leapt from like basically there was the potential it could have wiped your entire warband out in yeah. one spell um, he had a psych of 8 I rolled the d10 I only needed you know, to not roll a 9 or a 10. I think I rolled a 9. So yeah. he didn't get that spell away. Well, I was really looking forward to seeing that spell in action, just to see what happened. And then, of course, uh, your guys just opened fire on him. And it, I can't remember what you rolled. It was like 3d6 plus 4 or something. You got <laughs> you got this massive score, and my saving roll was 1d4 minus 1. So like we were saying at the time, he basically had a shell suit on. Yeah. And he paid the price. So, yeah, that was another another one of the big failures for me. I, I then had one of my other guys, Maro, he, he failed a break test after getting shot at. So even though I had undead characters, they, they still got pretty spooked, didn't they? Yeah. I make no bones about it. He was offski. Yeah, Rictus. See yeah. you at the party, Rictus. That was <laughs> one of my guys, so... Um, but a good, good enjoyable scenario. And, again, the fact that... I was, like, although the odds were so stacked against me at the end, in theory, I still could have won it because yeah. he could have got Scully down there against all odds. He wasn't that far away. And, you know, if he'd, if he'd managed to throw your guy away, I had the throw ability, which I used a couple of times. So I could have won it. And that I think that's what you want in these games. Like, as much as one person might take a pound, and as long as you're not completely out of the game, like, you, you could still get that you know, 90th minute winner against all odds, so. Yeah, and that keeps it balanced because you don't want it to be like, no, I had five guys, you had one. How could you kill them all in one go? That's ridiculous. What's the point? And it wasn't like that. And it also wasn't like, well, I'm down to four, you've still got five, I cannot win now. Mm -hmm. And I like the way it's balanced. I like the fact that most of the characters had to roll a D10 and hit four or under to shoot because that meant you know, more than half the time you were going to miss. And it just gave it a bit of uh, longevity for that, if you like. And and that combined with the fact that we only had potentially, and as it turned out, five turns to do it, there was no hanging about. But that with the aliens as well, you couldn't just hide behind cover. You, there's a job to do. There's a kind of a time limit. So you, it's kind of like speed chess in a way. You can't just rest on your laurels. You've got to go for it. What did you think of the card base system for activation as opposed to like set order? Yeah, if it was agility, then you you end up knowing the order of it. And I, I found it really quite fun with the cards because there were a few situations. I mean, I talked about Scully getting into a fight with that alien. Yeah. And it when it came into the new turn, if I'd drawn the Joker first. Scully could have been off the table. So it all came down to that, you know, is he going to activate before the alien? And I know this is more gamey and 
you know, I, I hate to use the term realistic in games like this with aliens and like zombies and stuff, but yeah, uh, you know, the argument might, might be well, the more agile character, it'd be more realistic if they went first. But I just I find this a bit more interesting because of the randomness of it. Definitely, because otherwise, like, say my uh, main chap, Mister Jaket who's got the ability to be a tactician and give advice to another character to have a bonus to the next role. If Jake at the very beginning of the game had been determined to be last um, during each turn, he was basically going to be kind of useless with that ability because there's no point me giving one of my other chaps uh, a bonus when I don't even know what the board's going to look like Mm -hmm. until next turn. So that chance for Jake to maybe be first and have a really good view of the board. Yeah, that that works better. So that kind of that that random aspect was, you know, it gives you many more possibilities basically. Because otherwise, once you know the order of things, then you can kind of plan it out and think, well, that's going to be best. And it takes out the variability or you know, the creativity, if you like. And it, I think the the sci fi setting where with guns, you know projectiles if you like fancy projectiles it's it's a lot more bloody than like we played the fantasy version the other week and you're having to get up on you know on folks faces and fight them hand to hand and it takes a wee bit longer usually to kill somebody that way yeah do you know what i definitely enjoyed the fact that it was more projectile based than melee especially in some games where it does get muddied Mm -hmm. and um, big you just clumps. end up with a pile. Yeah, don't like you? like Braveheart. There's just like three hundred people, and they're all just like slashing at each other in a big huddle. Yeah, you know, kind of like watching rugby, you know. So, yeah, this was this was a uh, more fun for me, and it was quicker. It kept the game flowing better. I would, I prefer this to the more melee based games. I would say. Yeah, I think um, one of my issues when that happens, and th- this game's pretty good for not. Over overpowering or underpowering somebody if they're in this big clump amongst loads of enemies, but some some games you do end up with like so there's a bonus for him, bonus for him, bonus for him, and then you're like, is this guy actually is he involved or is he not? And you yeah, you end up just it's like the amount of thought you have to give one of the roles takes you out the game and puts you back into like just you know scrambling for dice and uh, doing sums in your head, so. And the other thing was we never we never really had to worry about shooting into combat, somebody that's already in combat, and if you're allowed to do that or not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, that that made it easier just to keep the game going as well. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of this version of things. Cool. Well, we'll maybe stick by the rule set for the next time. The sci-fi scenarios book, there's no shortage of interesting things to try in there to yeah make sure you're doing something rather than just trying to kill one another so and i would say the proof in the pudding as well is that we finished an hour earlier than last time we it yeah. was like three hours and it was a tight three hours and it's only been two hours this time and that might be to a lot of people's preference because you may not have four hours to get set up and play a game and record an amazing award-winning potentially podcast or whatever yeah, and it's funny the the playing the playing mat is much smaller than last time, maybe half the size. Oh yeah. But what I find is when you when you do the games on the big four befores, you do pretty much just end up with the concentration of troops in the same small area anyway, and yeah, you just end up with this huge like empty space around what's happening. So I know that some games you do need the big playing area, but I think for games like this, you you maybe are better just going smaller because yeah, it's all going to concentrate around that objective anyway. Yeah, and it's tighter and there's more, there's obviously a lot more terrain, certainly a lot more terrain per square inch or whatever to hide behind and it's a bit more tactical. Uh, tighter board, more terrain to hide, more thinking, the, the guns aspect. Uh, this has been great. This is probably one of my favourite ones and not just because I won, but that did help. I made you a coffee as well, so it's been a a decent day for you. It's been a great morning, absolutely has. Well, always good to host you on the show, Robert. I'm sure the listeners will be happy, all three of them. So, (laughs) Yep, thanks guys. 
there you go then, a game of Planet 28, a scenario from the sci-fi skirmish scenarios book as well and I'm going to put photos of the game and a link in the show notes as well so be sure to check out them if you if you want a wee look at uh, the miniatures and the table and the setup and everything like that. On the painting table recently, uh, something I've also put on the site is pictures of the snotlands that I've been working on. So I had um, I had a bunch of snotlands from the 90s, which I did a really bad job of back in the day. They were, uh, you know how they, they came on a square base, I mean they still do, uh, depending on where you get them from, but the, if you turn the base around, you could see, it, it's like you're, you're supposed to drill through the base and you can see clearly the, the little slots that they fit into, but being a kid at the time I thought well, you know, the, the bases of the Snotlands, it's like these these little cyl- cylindrical, if I could say the word, slots that they go in. So I had turned the base the wrong way around and I knew f- fine and well what way bases were supposed to go, but I had them glued in upside down and then I think I just dipped the whole thing in sand like I was pretty, I, mean, I was a kid. Uh, I wasn't doing things very well, so uh, they looked horrible. They looked terrible and um, I found them years later and I managed to to rescue a lot of them, uh, strip the paint off, get everything off them and uh, I've been gradually rebuilding them so I've been working long term on a kind of goblin based war band and I've got a lot of goblins from Nightmare Miniatures, I've also talked on the show about my Jareth miniature, uh, David Bowie character to, to lead them all and it felt like a good time to add these snotlins to the ranks as well so I've got some large round bases, four large round bases, and I had a bunch of like uh, 3D prints of fungus and mushrooms and stuff like that off Etsy, which I've also used in my Norgo warband, especially around the, the Norglin bases. So a very similar project here is to get these snotlands ready. So I've got to the stage now where they're all based, you know, everything, all the scenery and terrain and that has been added on. They're, they're like almost mini wee. Uh, dioramas in their cells and um, I'm at the stage now where they've had the zenithal spray so they're pretty much ready to paint whenever I get to them. So like I say, link to the photos in the show notes as well of this episode or you could go straight to bedroombattlefields.com. I've been painting my 15 mil houses that I got from Alternative Armies, so I've completed two of those at time of recording. Really enjoyable. Um, again, the Zenithal Prime for these, and I've been using the contrast paints and just a bit of light dry brushing as well. And I'm I'm really happy with how they, they came up. I don't do a lot of terrain, don't don't paint a lot of terrain, but I feel like I'm always saying on this show that everything I paint is a nice wee palette cleanser. I'm not sure what I'm exactly cleansing my palette for constantly but I would say that these houses have been a nice wee palette cleanser as well so uh, I like I say the contrast paints come up really well on them and uh, just a, a nice light dry brush on some of the brickwork and that so I'm, I'm happy with them uh, looking forward to completing the set I think there's five in total so I'll gradually work my way through those I also have a 15 mil cannon for my good guy human army which I've finished up so bought the Canon and I think the crew, I bought them separately, both on the Ral Partha site, I think they were Demon World miniatures, so again a kind of multi-basing approach, I've got the crew and the Canon all on one square base, there's some cannonballs on there, there's like the box of uh, probably gunpowder or whatever, uh, and I'm really happy with how that's come up as well, and when I bought that on the Ral Partha site, I also um, come across this kind of, he's like a big pumpkin-headed sort of monster character. I suppose it would work in any scale, you know, 15, 28, whatever, but, uh, well, right enough, I say 15, but it'd be a very big pumpkin if, it, if you did it in 15 mil. So it's probably intended for 28. But he's um he's a big kind of, I don't know, like like he's been formed out of the parts of a farmer's field. Like, uh, there seems like a couple of, like, um, agricultural blades on his back and he's just all gnarly like made of roots and stuff and like I say his, his head is a pumpkin so pretty much a character intended for the kind of October period which fortunately we're not in now at time of recording it's March but uh, aye enjoyable I was going to say palette cleanser I'm, I'm going to stop saying that about things I've painted so he's 
been added to the, the painted ranks recently. Just awaiting a wee coat of varnish. So next up for me is going to be finishing these houses, getting some paint on these snotlands, and then I'm always going to have more 15mm troops to, to paint as well. So I'm thinking of doing my human cavalry next, or one of the sets of archers for either the orc and goblin ranks or the, the humans. So I'll see. I'll take my pick at some point. But uh, plenty to be getting on with on the 15mm project. Elsewhere, we did a great episode, a question of the month episode in February around Warhammer the Old World. I really enjoyed listening back to the responses. It got a really good reception from the listeners as well. And uh, the question of the month for March 2024 was around, you know, what hobby-related thing have you changed your mind about? And uh, in the middle of March, we've only actually had one response so far, so it's it's not it's not going quite so well. Um, obviously, if we, if we don't get a sufficient amount of responses, it's not really worth doing an episode about. So I don't know if that question's not quite hit the mark. Uh, maybe you've you know had some in mind and you've just not got round to sending it in yet. But uh, aye, time's getting on, so I would really appreciate some responses on that front. Bedroombattlefields.com forward slash voicemail or find the link in the show notes to this episode and you could send in your own thoughts on what hobby related thing that you've recently changed your mind about would really appreciate it if you did that so on the gaming front then we've obviously heard that wee report of the planet 28 game that robert and i recently played uh, next time around i'm going back into the fantasy genre i was having a wee look at my miniatures the other day and uh, as much as i i never buy modern gw stuff i did like three or four years ago i got the Chaos Marauders, which I thought were really cool miniatures, I still do, so bought them, painted them up, uh, and I totally forgot about them, to be honest, but I was having a wee look over certain miniatures recently, and I thought it'd, it'd be cool to, you know, sometimes you see models and you think, God, you know, a, a story starts to formulate in your head, this is kind of what was going on there, so uh, I've always been a fan of telling stories, you know, throughout my life I've written a lot of fiction, uh, as some of you might know, I've created a lot of audio drama as well, which I, you know, don't want to divert us, but I, I just don't get the time to do that these days. So building wee scenarios around miniatures and setting up uh, stories, it's just a really good way to scratch that itch, that storytelling itch. So this is kind of what I'm looking at doing next. I thought, let's get these marauders having to do something here. They've got a captive. Uh, and I was thinking, well, we'll do... We'll do some sort of a raid on a village. But then I was thinking, you know, I don't want to do this cliched, like, here come some Vikings or Marauders and they're going to, you know, butcher everyone in this innocent village. I thought, why don't we, why don't we make this village some sort of obscure, sinister, forgotten little outpost on the edge of the empire where the, the villagers themselves are actually sort of chaos worshippers and the reason for that, again, this goes back to one of the miniatures that I have available in my collection now. I've got this kind of Krell proxy, so he's like an undead chaos warrior. So I thought, maybe thousands of years ago, this uh, famous chaos champion had died in the area, and he was buried here, and this, this village has ended up being built around where he was buried, and it means that the villagers themselves have got, uh, you know, if not sympathies to the chaos gods, then outright allegiance to them. And maybe celestially at this point in time, they're able to perform this ritual to try and raise this uh, this chaos champion from his grave. So I thought to myself, let's let's give the villagers some sort of priest or shaman, and the marauders could be escorting you know their own kind of priest or shaman as well. So it's it's two competing war bands trying to complete this ritual to summon this chaos champion and basically have them join their ranks for, you know, various different uh, reasons, I suppose, that they want that to happen. So I'm thinking two captive miniatures at different corners of the table, and the priests, let's just call them the priests of each warband, standing next to them. So have each player roll a d6 at the end of each turn, or the start of each turn, and it's the first person that gets to 20 who has uh, summoned the, the Chaos Champion. So looking at dice averages, uh, six rolls of a d6, you'll be hitting about 21. So obviously a player could roll really well and get there quite quick. 
or they could roll really badly and not get there at all. But you know, the the first the first player to get there, that's that's the point in the game where this chaos champion miniature appears on the tabletop. And then you could have other dynamics as well. You know, maybe that automatically means he joins their their side. Maybe you still need to roll off and he could actually join the other side. Maybe he could become an NPC and, uh, you know, be essentially fighting both sides as well. So there's lots of opportunities there to see what we could do with that. I'm thinking of using Song of Blades and Heroes in order to, you know, I'm really wanting to strip back the rules of the game to really let the, the story come to the forefront here. I'm looking at event cards, leaning on the, the sort of Rangers of Shadow Deep style event card deck. I want to create some of them and just have, you know, lots of possibilities for twists and turns uh, just to really, really tell a quite an immersive story around this. Of course, the tricky part with event cards, you know, if, you, if you're going for that like event deck or clue deck uh, style of play, seen in Rangers of Shadow Deep. The, the tricky part of marrying that up with Song of Blades and Heroes is that the the turn transition is uh, is pretty volatile because if you've played the game before, you'll know that characters have a quality score and depending on your role, you know, you might get two or three activations, one, two, three activations, or you might lose your turn entirely. And that means it, it's very hard to predict how many events cards would be you know if, if we're talking about uh, each time the turn transitions we'll pull a we'll pull an event card out you could actually you know you you could be flirting back between turns pretty quickly so it's it's hard to predict how many cards you'd need obviously you'd need to put some you'd need to have some filler cards in there where just nothing happens because you don't want like you know, one turn the weather goes this way, the next turn here comes this random monster, etc, etc. That would just get too hard to keep up with and a bit too silly. So I'm still trying to figure out a way around that, whether that means just taking out the um, the turn transition, you know, the quality roll thing. There, there are ways around it, you know, I've played enough of these wee skirmish games that you can kind of almost build one up with like a hodgepodge uh, you know, maybe I take this from Song of Blades and Heroes. I like the idea of using the movement sticks rather than the measuring tape. Um, the very simple combat mechanics there, but maybe I'll pull some stuff from Brutal Quest, Open Combat, Frostgrave itself, you know, who knows? I'll, I'll put some together, but really the main intention is on the story, the events, uh, the scenario and the objectives and stuff like that. So elsewhere, a couple of wee random ideas that I was toying with recently. This is one of the typical like um, moments of inspiration you get when you've got a, a kid and you know you're either reading something or they're watching something on the TV or whatever. But uh, my wee girl, she's really into the. It's, I'm sure it's the Julia Donaldson books. It's like the Gruffalo and Zog the Dragon and everything. But there's one called Room on the Broom. You're maybe familiar with it if you've got kids at a similar age. But uh, she had that on in the telly and it was, um, you know, the, the witch on the broomsticks uh, fighting this dragon. And uh, I don't know why this idea manifested here because I've I've seen like all the Game of Thrones and everything which are packed full of dragons. But uh, I just got thinking like a dragon combat game, you know, an aerial dragon combat game. That'd be a really cool idea, wouldn't it? Uh, because I know that you've got games like, uh, is it Blood Red Skies? Andy Chambers game and it's... So obviously it's um, World War II aeroplanes, but what if you just took a rule set like that and got some dragon miniatures and, you know, had a had an aerial combat game between dragons? Maybe that does exist. If it does, please let me know about it. But on the other hand, I really don't need to be uh, buying new miniatures and getting distracted with a completely new project as well. I don't even know what sort of you know, what, what scale would you use for that? Would you would you just use your sort of standard uh, 28 mil dragon, probably with a, a guy on the back? Would you be able to find dragons that looked more like they were in flight? And at a smaller scale as well, I think you'd probably need to scale down a bit. So, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a 6 to 10 or 15 mil dragon that you could, like I say, have more... Uh, visually like they, they were in flight rather than on the ground so just a half-baked not even half-baked idea that I wanted to I suppose just say out loud to to get it off my chest 
And another such idea, uh, I've had this for a couple of years now, I've been thinking about Under the Sea as a setting for a miniatures game. And I have seen in the Miniature War Games magazine, I've seen a few examples of this, but from what I could remember, it was more like, um, I think there was James Bond style settings and also Stingray, I'm sure it was, you know, Stingray, the, the, the puppet show for back in the day. And what I had in mind was more of a Lovecraftian setting you know, maybe even going down the 20,000 leagues under the sea route, but, you know, quite a, a grim or gothic setting under the sea, those old school diving suits, and, um, you know, you've got Rolye and Cthulhu and all the stuff that Lovecraft put in the ocean that you've got to play with. So I, I think you'd have not only a really cool aesthetic there, but great opportunities, again, to tell stories and for thematic and unusual mechanics as well. Again, maybe this does exist already. But uh, again, stuff like this requires a lot of new, probably conversions, a lot of new painting styles, a lot of new types of terrain. And uh, aye, it's a whole different project on my own. And new projects definitely aren't something I'm seeking out at the moment, if ever. But uh, aye, just an idea that I can't kind of shake, you know, I always keep coming back to turning it over in my head. So undersea stuff, you know, the whole Lovecraft vibe, I think there's definitely a lot of potential there. One final idea that I'm going to throw out there and do absolutely nothing with in all likelihood is uh, the setting of Titan, which some of you might know as the biggest moon of Saturn. This is a place that I've been fascinated with since the landing in the Huygens probe in 2005. And it's such a fascinating world because it's straight out of science fiction, but, you know, it's it's literally real. Uh, but it's just it's just almost inaccessible for us at the moment. We, we have obviously, I say we as in humanity, has put the Huygens probe on there. We've got um, some very grainy images of the place. And I believe... The next mission to Titan, obviously unmanned, but that launches in 2028, and I think it gets there in 2034. So Titan, if you're not aware of it already, is the only, the only, um, it's not a planet, literally, it's a moon, but it's the only place with a, an atmosphere in our solar system that we know of. I'm pretty confident of that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But instead of the, the atmosphere that we have here on Earth, you you know, on Titan, you've got hydrocarbon lakes and seas instead. And the biggest one of those hydrocarbon uh, oceans is called Kraken Mare. And I've, I've been uh, fascinated with that for a long time. Just the thought that you could have this big sea, but it's not water. It's like oils and chemicals and stuff like that. You know, the whole place has got this orange glow to it, this thick, cloudy atmosphere you know, there's a chance that you might be able to see Saturn in the horizon and, you know, it's rings and stuff like that. So it's just a visually just a really fascinating place. It's not impossible that there might be some weird life as we don't know it, um, life forms there, you know, but we just don't know at this stage. So really cool place. And again, fantastic potential for a miniatures game, in my opinion. But on that note, like I did mention earlier on about writing fiction and creating audio drama and stuff like that, and I did actually um, create an audio drama, a short, a short story audio drama set on Titan. Uh, I made this back in 2015, so scarily it's like not a kick in the nuts off uh, 10 years old, but I, th I, th I think this is probably the best audio drama piece that I ever made and although this this show is not about audio drama or fiction or anything like that just because I'd been talking about it recently uh, thinking about it recently and talking about it as a great setting for a miniatures game and Robert's been on the show today and he's in this because we work together on a lot of audio drama I thought I'd just play us out with that so if you're interested in it here's an audio drama story set on Titan called Kraken Mary.
command, this is Jameson. Come in, Captain. I can confirm we successfully entered the atmosphere of Titan at mission time 1173-851. We are approaching 250 feet from the surface. Chutes were deployed at 3,000 feet. Copy that. How's your visibility? We're currently penetrating a thick cloud level. It's pretty dense. No view of the surface just yet. It'll make Edinburgh look like Bermuda down there. Aye, well, the captain would get sunburned reading a holiday brochure. That'll suit him just fine. Well, at least I'll be the only human being setting foot on Titan who still has a head of hair, McGovern. Well, hopefully you'll keep hold of it once we discover what's lying down there. Visibility improving now, Butler. We are through most of this cloud layer. How's it looking? The lighting isn't great, but we're getting a pretty clear view of the landscape. The Sea of Kraken Mare is spread out to our left. I can see a mountain range off to our right. Looks like we'll be landing between five and 800 yards from the coastline. The sky is heavy. Those methane clouds are dark and brooding. The whole landscape has a rusty orange tinge to it. Do you have a surface temperature reading? Minus 161 degrees Celsius, Butler. And that's a balmy minus 251 degrees Fahrenheit. Better get the fur coats looked out. Indeed. Okay, Butler, we better get strapped in for landing. We'll report back once we're safely on the surface. Copy that. Good luck. Cheers. Welcome to Titan. History has been made today as the first manned mission to Titan reportedly touched down just a few hours ago. The expedition won the race to reach the mysterious moon orbiting Saturn ahead of countless others, including NASA. Their mission, funded by British entrepreneur Jennifer Barry, is to investigate what appears to be some kind of wreckage on the floor of the moon's biggest methane ocean, Kraken Mare. The discovery was made by the Wells Dyson satellite almost nine years ago and sparked a frantic space race that might finally answer one of humanity's biggest unanswered questions. Are we alone in the universe? Barry's team is made up of only three astronauts, Scotsman Frank Jameson and Duncan McGovern, who will conduct the groundwork on Titan, and London-born Dr. Laura Butler, who will man the control ship from the moon's orbit. The mission, which took just over two years to reach Titan, had been criticized by NASA as being rushed, careless, and grossly undermanned. But as news reached Earth that her accelerated expedition program appears to have paid off, Barry hit back at the space agency, who don't launch their own flight to Titan until February next year. The pensioners at NASA need about four years of budget meetings just to organize a night out at the cinema, don't they? <laughs> I think we've all been dreadfully excited about that object on the floor of the sea on Titan. It's really captured the imagination of the whole world. I've been fascinated by the prospect of life on other planets since I was a little girl, so money was no object when I put together this mission. To suggest that it was rushed and understaffed is ludicrous. Our three astronauts are the most capable, competent and skilled individuals I've ever met. Sometimes bigger isn't always better. When the Americans finally get there, we'll already have built a hotel to put them up in. From this moment, the entire human race holds its breath in anticipation. The team now face the daunting task of diving down 160 meters to the bottom of this freezing methane ocean to investigate the object, which is said to be about the size of a Chinook helicopter. But Barry insists that with her equipment and training, this should be a routine mission. Microsub ready to roll, Captain. I'll get a start in calibrating that reverse fuel cell. Good work. I've got your suit ready. Glad I'm finally somewhere cold enough to wear the bloody thing. I nearly melted away to a puddle the last time I had it on. Well, you'll be thankful for it once you're outside and under the surface. If you so much as dipped your big toe in that stuff without it, you'd be dead in minutes. 
and there was me about to get the speedos on. <laughs> Christ, what a sight that would have been. I'd have looked like David Hasselhoff jogging into the Pacific on Baywatch. Aye, nipples harder than diamonds and a scrotum the size of a walnut. The perfect image to greet some extraterrestrial life for me. Well, like I've always said, if something or someone crashed that thing, they'll be doing incredibly well to be staying alive down there. Especially if it's been sitting there for ten million years. Just as long as I don't have to give anything the kiss of life. Please don't. If it wakes up in phone's home, you can bet Earth would be obliterated before we even got you back to the surface. Huh. You need a hand with it? Well, this? Uh, nah, I'm done. Come on. Let's go and get the land roamer set up. Okay, Captain, coordinates from the landing point are uploading to the land room interface now. That will give you the closest point from the shoreline to the objective. Good work, Butler. Everything running smoothly down here, all equipment serviced and ready to go. We'll be bedding down for the night in an hour or so. Technically, the night isn't for another ten days, Captain. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not sure I brought enough coffee to fully adjust a Titan cycle just yet. Let's stick with good old GMT for now. Who's McGovern? Ah, he's fine. I can tell he's nervous, but who wouldn't be? It's a fairly straightforward route from the coast, 432 metres in, 148 metres down. I suppose that's easy for me to say, sitting up here. He practically lived in that micro-sub for eight months before we left Earth. He'll be just fine. I know. Anyway, if you need anything else before tomorrow, just shout. I'll let you get some rest. Good night, Captain. Night, Butler. What's that you're reading? Jane Spotton. Hmm. Irvin Welsh, eh? That's an old one. Aye. Reminds me of home, though. Missing it, eh? Missing the wife and the wee man. And the cat. It's not easy. I know we have a laugh and a joke, but think about where we are right now. Where we actually are right now. You're having your moment of clarity, then? Yeah, that moment when you lie back and think, here I am, lying in bed, reading a book about two men sitting in a pub in Edinburgh. And I'm on Titan. Fucking Titan. Incredible, I know. Funny you should say that about your book, too. What do you mean? Well, think about it. You said you are reading about people living everyday lives in Edinburgh. When that book was written, I bet most people read sci-fi books about space travel to places like Titan. Huh, I suppose you're right. They read about us, reading about them. Well, I'm going to get some sleep. Tomorrow, we'll certainly be giving the folks on Earth plenty to read about. We sure will. Night, McGovern. And don't you be up all night reading. Night, Captain. Just one more chapter. <laughs> you sound like my daughter. McGovern to command. Lonely night up there, was it? Lonely? No way. It was great to get some peace and quiet. Rubbish. You missed yourself anyway. Yeah? Yep. Jameson threw a huge party. The Titan police came and told us to turn the music down. Hmm. <laughs> You're such a rebel. Ready for the big plunge then? Sure am. Snug as a bug in this aqua armour. Jameson's been off collecting samples from the ground around the module. Don't listen to him, Butler. I was busy cleaning up the mess from this party that we allegedly had last night. You fit and ready, McGovern? Waiting to go, Captain. Hop on then. I'll drive. Butler, we'll check back with you once we reach the coast. Copy that. Hope you remembered your fishing rods.
cracking mare, eh? She's a fair old size. I can't even see the other side. Not that I can see very far in any direction in this bloody place. Five times the size of Lake Superior, to be exact. Or, if you want a Scottish comparison, nearly 1,500 times the size of Loch Ness. Well, I suppose, unlike Loch Ness, at least we know for sure there's something down there. I guess we'll find out for sure soon enough, eh? Come on, let's get this micro-sub disconnected. Upon their arrival on the shores of Kraken Mare, one member of Barry's team, Edinburgh-born astronaut and deep-sea diver Duncan McGovern, will board and operate a tiny one-person submarine known as a microsub down into the depths of this freezing ocean of liquid methane. The microsub is one of the finest bits of kit in our arsenal. It's a one-man craft and looks a bit like an egg lying on its side. We wanted it to be as small as possible so we could get close to, and even inside, anything we might find down there. It was custom built not as a water submersible, but specifically to dive in liquid methane. As an operator, Mr. McGovern is exceptionally skilled. He took a prototype model down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench three years ago. Whatever it is lying under Kraken Mare, you can be sure he'll find it. Though liquid methane can be a clear substance, the heavy clouds on Titan mean visibility will be rather poor. The microsub has state-of-the-art infrared cameras on every side, however, so as far as Mr. McGovern is concerned, it'll be like scuba diving in the shallows of the Caribbean. I'm approaching a depth of 100 metres below surface level. Visibility remains good. No noticeable current down here either. Very still. Aye, the waves are barely two centimetres high. I doubt this will become a space tourist destination for surfers in the future. Never say never, Captain. If Barry wants that, she'll make it happen. Your temperature has dropped a bit. How are you feeling? A bit colder, yeah. Didn't think that would be possible in this gear. Well, you are further away from the sun now than any human's ever been in history. Don't I know it. Temperature is stable again. We'll need to keep an eye on it, though. Objective is now visible. I'm 30 metres from the seabed. Have you got a decent view of it yet? Not much better than the satellite images so far. But getting closer. I'm going to lock on now. McGovern? I've locked onto the objective. 15 metres from seabed. Is everything okay? I've lost your picture. I had a bit of feedback when I locked on. Maybe we were picking up some sort of static, or maybe it's the methane. Well, I've only got radio communication with you at the moment. Can you try locking off again? Copy. How's that? Still nothing. My cameras are still picking everything up. Must just be a signal issue. Don't worry, Captain. You'll see it all once I'm back up there. Two metres above seabed and stabilising. Christ, it's cold. Well, that's far from ideal, the picture and the temperature. I guess it's just my punishment for having all the fun. Well, I don't like it. Maybe we should abort. Oh, hell no. Captain, I I'm fine, honestly. It's just a minor feedback issue. You're not jealous, are you? I'm heading towards objective now. The seabed is more uneven than we'd anticipated. There's some rock faces and plateaus to our left and, and behind. How is your visibility? Good. I'll tell you what, Captain. There's some big caves down here. Might be worth another trip or two later in the week. One thing at a time, McGovern. McGovern? Sorry, Captain. I'm approaching the objective and... What is it? Come on, talk to me. It's like nothing I've ever seen. Honestly, you, you wouldn't believe it. Is everything all right? 
Everything's fine. Better than fine. This is just incredible. Well, spill the beans then, for the love of God. Is it some sort of... Craft. Yeah. It's a spacecraft for sure, Captain. It's about the size of a house, made of a kind of almost rocky looking material. I can't identify it. Maybe it's a buildup of sediment or some other localised environmental effect. Can you get close enough to take a sample? Even a scraping? I'm just heading round to the... Oh, bloody hell! What? Oh, will you stop doing that? I can't see anything. You're not believe this, Captain. There's a huge tear in the wall of the thing. I think something must have shot it down. Come on now, McGovern. That's wild speculation. It's more than likely just crash impact damage. At this gravity? I don't think so. The craft was almost certainly attacked. There's more damage right across this side. Just keep documenting it and leave the analysis till later. Five seconds into discovering that we're not alone in the universe, now we're fantasizing about more extraterrestrial races. Why would it have to be another race who attacked them? We've managed just fine fitting amongst ourselves on Earth all these years. I was hoping we'd find proof of other life forms who weren't a pile of bastards like us, though. I think I might be able to get inside. Inside? You mean the... The craft, yeah. The hole on the side is easily big enough. Are you sure? Let's get a closer look. This is amazing! Is there anything... anyone in there? The equipment is like nothing I've ever seen before. There's some sort of control panel straight in front of me. I'm guessing that's where they flew the thing from. You're still filming it all, right? Are you kidding? I'll get a hundred billion hits on YouTube for this. <laughs> YouTube? What age are you? It's making a comeback. My granddad said that about Facebook for years. I think I see... <laughs> Holy fuck! What? There's two bodies over here, at the far end of this chamber. What kind of bodies? Physical bodies. Corpses. Hold on. Let me get a bit closer. Would you look at that? Well, I can't, can I? What is it? Remember when we were doing our physicals at the Institute? There was that really tall guy with a big nose and comb over? Eh? Big skinny guy. Looked like someone had put a suit on a flagpole. McGovern, what the hell is this? Well, if he had had sex with an aunt, these guys would be their kids. <sighs> Hardly Neil Armstrong's one giant step spiel, is it? I think Christ, we're not broadcasting directly back to Earth. Have you got a sensible or, dare I say it, a scientific description of these beings? I'd say about eight to ten feet tall. Humanoid. Leathery or rubbery textured suits or skin. But I'm sure it's suits. No sign of mouths or eyes. But I'm sure those aren't helmets. Can you get one back up with you? I could, but what if the methane's preserving them? You said yourself this might have been here for millennia. Hmm. I suppose you're right. We can come back tomorrow with one of the airlock capsules. Some of the controls on this side look a bit like sonar equipment. There doesn't appear to be any windows either. I suppose if you don't have eyes, you don't need windows. Good shout. I never thought of that. Does it look like they navigated with any sort of big screens, computers, consoles? That sort of thing. There's no obvious signs of anything like that. Hmm. Something is troubling me a wee bit though, Captain. What's that? I'm not entirely sure that this was a spacecraft. Well, what else could it have been, McGovern? I mean, everything you've described suggests that it... 
I think. It might have been a submersible. A submarine? But you said it had been attacked from the outside. What the hell was that? McGovern, what's going on? I'm seeing a lot of movement on the surface. I'm not hanging around to find out. I'm on my way back. Hurry, the surface is getting really choppy now. I'm approaching the exit. There's a strong current down here. I'm having to fight with the controls. How quickly can you... Oh no. What is it? Have you... Caves. But there's... McGovern! McGovern, do you copy? McGovern, do you copy? McGovern, God damn it, get up here now! surviving member of the team, Dr. Laura Butler, faces a long and lonely trip back to Earth. Butler herself had not set foot on Titan and could only listen on in horror as her comrades met their grisly fate. Yesterday, she sent an emotional message back to her friends, family, and the rest of us here on Earth. We knew the risks when we signed up for the mission. The guys knew the risks of landing on Titan. The discoveries they made in their short time down there have dwarfed the other significant discoveries of mankind. What we discovered on Titan changes everything. We discovered that we are not alone in the universe, that there exists or has existed another form of intelligent life, a species with superior technology and an obvious curiosity for space exploration. But I believe we discovered something else, something ancient and terrible. Though this creature's ferocity, strength and size is unrivaled on Earth, I think we can console ourselves that it doesn't present any immediate danger to us, unless we should return to its home. For anyone else that heads to that cold, forbidding world, God help them. Way back in 2008, when scientists named the frigid, bleak ocean of Kraken Mare after a mythical sea monster, they were closer than they could have ever imagined. Chillingly close. Thanks very much for listening to this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then please do share it with someone else you think might enjoy it too. And be sure to check out our Discord community of like-minded hobbyists, which you can find at bedroombattlefields.com forward slash discord. It'd be great to see you in there.